Listen only mode. Good evening and welcome to tonight's premium account live market update webinar. The information is prepared for general information of traders and investors. The information does not take into consideration the specific needs, investment objectives or financial situation of any person. Any individual reading or listening should discuss with their financial planner or advisor the merits of any recommendation or offer presented in this material for their own specific circumstances and realise that not all investments are appropriate for every individual. Presented tonight, myself, Leon Hine, current Managing Director of Global Equity Management. The format for this evening's presentation, we're going to take a look at the global macro outlook uh, driving equity markets across 2012. We'll roll through the ASX top 50 uh, <coughs> charts this evening and as we do that we will take a look at the uh, upcoming earnings season review and to the extent that companies have already reported we'll look at the specific numbers that are being printed and we'll also uh, uh, analyse the price to earnings ratio uh, across the top 50 stocks or at least the stocks that we are investing in at present and we'll conclude tonight's presentation with a short term uh, market outlook followed by a quick review of the market analyzer 7 and the upcoming release of the product. The services that uh, Investor Signals provide are up on screen there. If you'd like to know more about those, please contact either myself or Christine, info at investorsignals.com. Now moving uh, straight into a graph of the uh, Dow Jones and sharing our thoughts on the uh, macro outlook for 2012. In sharp contrast to 2011, you know, sentiment in global markets has improved considerably you know, over the past few months. Uh, stronger global liquidity is boosting uh, investor appetite for riskier assets. Uh, economic momentum in the US is continuing and whilst I suppose there is an anticipation of slower uh, economic growth in Asia, so far that hasn't materialised and to some extent inflation has, a, has maintained a, a slightly elevated level uh, in the Asian markets and I'll get to that a little bit more in particular when we get to reviewing our uh, bulk commodity names. So the US continues to reflect a moderate but sub-trend pace of growth so uh, historically the US economy should be growing within that sort of range of 3 to 4 percent GDP at present it's tracking somewhere around two and a half percent so it is um, below trend and I think the Federal Reserve over the course of 2012 will look for further policy response uh, in the form of a quantitative easing three of some nature to continue to ensure that the US recovery continues to pick up speed and ultimately uh, delivers trend growth in that three to four percent band. Uh, <coughs> the positives in the US economy, the trend in initial jobless claims um, and non-farm payroll as well as manufacturing and the non-manufacturing ISM readings all point to sort of a reasonable demand environment. Uh, the manufacturing sector has probably been a, a distinct um, beneficiary of the weak US dollar and again in a moment when we get to the graph of the euro I'll chat a bit more about uh, the policy uh, initiatives of the Fed that are likely to sort of keep that US dollar pressure in place. Uh, the FOMC meeting recently, uh, Ben Bernanke indicated that the policy rate will likely remain on hold until 2014, so that's the you know, near zero interest rate policy that the FOMC has adopted, um, and that's obviously reinforcing that long term bond yields are likely to remain low for a considerable time, therefore investors seeking yield uh, have no choice but to be driven into uh, risk assets or into equity markets. So over the course of the last uh, 12 months, certainly a theme that was in place in 2011 and has continued to be uh, a focus of investment allocations in 2012 has been chasing sort of the high yielding uh, blue chip stocks and as we roll through the top 50 we'll talk about you know, how that applies to our domestic market. Uh, in Europe, and tonight we have a number of listeners that are joining us for the first time, so they may not have be aware of sort of some of the you know, change in macro policy uh, at a, uh, in particular in among or, or in Europe uh, by the ECB over the course of the past few months. So if you go back into 2011, there was obviously a lot of uncertainty around 
the framework that the ECB and the EU were attempting to put in place to address the debt issues in, in Europe. In December, the ECB opened up its long-term refinancing operation, uh, which essentially provided close to unlimited liquidity into the European banking system, and prior to December, that wasn't in place. So far already, the European banks have drawn down almost 500 billion euros, and over the next month or so, it's highly probable that that uh, long-term uh, financing operation will be extended by almost up to another trillion uh, euros, so totaling $1.5 trillion that essentially the European banks have been able to tap the ECB for at you know, rates in the order of 1%. So <clears throat> in the media, I'm sure if you follow sort of market commentary, you would note that the uh, bond um, yields of stressed European countries, so Italy, Spain in particular, that became the centrepiece of sort of market commentary last year where uh, mark risk was heightened and we're seeing yields creep in, in Italy uh, and Spain up upwards of sort of 7% and that started to really derail the market and we saw the aggressive sell-off that equity markets went through and just pointing to the chart on screen there at the moment throughout that sort of September-October period. By December the ECB had in implemented these liquidity lines to the banks so essentially what you're seeing is the banks taking money off the ECB at 1% buying uh, sovereign bonds yielding initially 7% and that added demand from that liquidity that the ECB has given the banks is, a, is helping to drive down the yields of those uh, troubled sort of sovereign nations which is putting at ease some of the market tension that had existed throughout 2011 and that's a really important structural piece for investors to understand. Um, as when the US, although they went about it a bit different and maybe in the coming weeks I can chat about that you know, in more detail, but essentially it was the beginning of a significant turning point in the recovery for the US economy. So hopefully we're at a similar sort of crossroad uh, now in, uh, in the recovery uh, taking hold in Europe. Um, all right, so that sort of sets the background of what happened last year in particular what is the most important sort of structural change that we've witnessed in the market over the last eight weeks that has I think sort of given uh, the foundations to the rally that we've seen sort of carrying on sort of through December and January. Uh, going to the very short term uh, news of the market, so last night US stocks <coughs> were pretty much closed uh, flat. They were down uh, considerably or they were down going into sort of the last half an hour of trade and then you know there was a sharp rally in the last sort of 10 to 15 minutes that brought the market back up to uh, a break even point but essentially material stocks and financials were marginally lower throughout the session. Uh, data on US retail sales in January fell slightly short of expectation but not enough to I think cause any uh, reconsideration of asset allocations for professional money managed. Auto sale data was again a little bit soft. So we have, whilst broadly the key data has been strong in the US with unemployment um, picture improving, manufacturing picking up, retail or consumer confidence <coughs> remaining at strong levels, there has been a little bit of mixed uh, weaker data over the course of the last month or so and I think that will feed into the Fed's thinking around quantitative easing over the next couple of months which again I'll get to that uh, as we move through the presentation tonight. So up on screen what you're seeing there with the graph of the Dow Jones is essentially we've had a long-term view that the US economy or in particular the S&P 500 uh, companies were delivering an expected run rate of earnings per share of close to $25. So even when you go back to the, sort of the depths of the negativity that was occupying sort of the media throughout September, October, uh, in, investor signals, account holders, you know, we were faced with the decision of is this a change of structural trend and is the market heading lower? And you know, that's always a tough call when you're surrounded by the negativity that exists in the media at that particular point in time, but we stuck to our belief that the December quarterly earnings would come in maybe not quite matching the September run rate. So if you look at the 
S&P 500 earnings from July through to September, they averaged $25 earnings per share and that was a current run rate high for the quarter. So we had an expectation that December would at least equal that but we couldn't build a uh, investment case for the December quarter outperforming given the issues that were taking place in Europe at the time. So we maintained our long exposure across both our internal account and client accounts on the assumption that come uh, US earnings season, which essentially is nearing to an end at the moment over the course of the next week to 10 days, but so far we're more than halfway through earnings season and earnings are tracking just marginally below this $25 level. So if you, on that basis, if you transfer the equivalent uh, value of the S&P 500 at 12 times earnings, which is a 12 times multiple, it translates to the Dow Jones trading at around 12,500 points. So that X essentially marks the spot where at the end of January we had a view that based on uh, US earnings, fair market value was at 12,500 and the radio recordings or market strategy sessions that we've presented to our clients over the past weeks, we've had a view that the market would remain fairly buoyant throughout earnings season and then we'd probably get a minor retracement in the month or so following. Uh, if you look at analyst expectations longer term for 2012, there's still forecasting roughly 10% earnings growth from where we are at the moment, which would have a year-end target on the Dow at around 13,500. Now, at this point in time, we're not positioning our portfolio, portfolio on the basis that the market's moving up to that level anytime soon. We're more of the view that we're at fair value when you take into account that the IMF is also forecasting a minor retraction in or in uh, global GDP in 2012, I think sort of the most optimistic case uh, sets a target up at around 13 and a half. I think our neutral case maintains that the market sits within this range of 12,000 to 13 and a half thousand points throughout 2012 and right across the next few months, mainly trading at or near this sort of 12,500 level. Um, just before I move on, if you're not sort of familiar with PE ratios and the historical long running average. Essentially the US S&P 500 historically over the last sort of 10 years or so has tracked at around 14 times earnings. So we're trading at still roughly a 20% discount to the long running price to earning ratio. Uh, and that discount has been in place ever since the GFC began and there's probably no immediate catalyst for the re-rating given that that uh, discount is largely reflective of the excessive debt levels that governments are holding and there's no short term resolution to that, albeit the printing presses are working overtime uh, you know, in all the developed economies to over a given enough period of time to debase the debt levels that we have. Um, but you know, that aside, our investment assumptions continue to assume that markets trade at a discount to the long running uh, PE. So when I come to the XJO in a moment uh, and reference that, you know, we all have an understanding of, uh, of what it is that we're referring to. So moving on from the Dow on to our domestic market, um, you know, some may uh, question why is it that the US markets had such a strong rally out of that September low and we've lagged in particular over the course of the last uh, month or so or essentially through this sort of December, January rally. Um, and I've just made some notes on screen there. So obviously the Aussie dollar headwind, the strength of the Aussie dollar given the yield differential uh, that uh, uh, between Australia and, and most developed economies uh, <coughs> and our maintained AAA uh, rating in Australia. So the pool of AAA rated countries is shrinking rapidly. Uh, emerging markets have obviously, um, governments of emerging markets are seeking to diversify their currency exposure and albeit at the margin we're only getting uh, uh, minor increases in allocation, it's obviously enough to increase demand especially in light of the uh, yield differential as well. So when the Aussie dollars uh, at, at elevated levels it both impacts from uh, investors taking money out of Australian market less uh, demand for Australian equities with the dollar at elevated levels. There's been short-term weakness in our 
in, in the commodity sector and in particular in hard commodity prices. So you've seen iron ore pull back from 160 you know, a tonne down to around 130. Um, <clears throat> you know, obviously oil's held up well, but you know, in the metal markets we've seen some commodity weakness there. And in particular, bank funding costs have remained elevated as a result of the issues out of Europe. So when you consider that both the resources and the banks make up a very large percentage of our index, and both of those have had some levels of headwind there, you can under begin to understand combined with the Aussie dollar why our market has underperformed. Uh, that being said, um, you know, if we take this uh, logic of where we see fair value for the Dow Jones at 12,500 points and overlay that on our domestic market, it comes out at a valuation at around 44 to 4,500 points is in theory where we should be trading if we didn't have this added uh, headwind of the issues I just spoke about. Um, I think <coughs> the commodity weakness and bank funding pressures probably should abate and, and the outlook in regard to those two headwinds improve. I don't see any immediate change to the uh, Aussie dollar uh, upward uh, bias and quite possibly trending higher from where we are at the moment. So I think on that basis a good outcome for our market would be if we were able to push up to that 4400. Are we able to get up to 4600 by mid-year? Uh, while some analysts are calling for those type of levels, we're still in the camp of thinking that the market probably mainly stays within this band of 4150 to 4400, and that again ties in with our macro view that I expressed earlier on the Dow Jones. Uh, and like with the Dow Jones or the US market, our market also trades at roughly a 20% discount to its long running average. Okay, so moving on from the domestic market, we'll have a quick look at the currency market. So <clears throat> just whilst we're on the topic, the Aussie dollar. So the market was a little bit surprised about the RBA not cutting rates. I think most analysts or nearly all analysts had expected another 25 uh, basis point cut. That didn't happen. Um, the RBA cited uh, improved uh, conditions in Europe and I think in particular they were focusing uh, around the change in policy that the ECB implemented in December that I spoke of at the beginning of the presentation and I think they probably want to sit on the sideline over the next month or two, uh, much to the bank's disgust uh, and to Australian uh, households um, who would dearly love to see further rate cuts so I suppose we'll just have to wait and see whether the, um, you know, what pressures ultimately win out. But given that the RBA is still concerned about long-term inflation, I, I suspect that they're continuing to err on the side of caution there. Um, given the market was <coughs> fairly uh, certain that the rate cut was coming through, we had a bit of a short squeeze on the Aussie dollar following the rate cut not taking place. Uh, and the market settled back a little bit at the moment, but essentially we have a view that the Aussie dollar fair value is around 105. Um, in an environment that further quantitative easing is pushed through by the Federal Reserve in the US, we could see the Aussie dollar push up to 112. Um, just moving on to the euro from there. So if you go back over the course of the last six to nine months, the euro obviously started to come under pressure as the sovereign debts really sort of gained this sort of second uh, innings after sort of dealing with it to some extent in 2010 and then the resurgence of these sovereign issues uh, in 2011 uh, and obviously speculation that you know will the euro hold together, will there be countries that exit the euro and the case for holding euro dollars throughout that you know, was pretty limited and essentially we had this sort of downward pressure here. If you look at sort of over this most recent sell-off where it cracked the sort of 140 level and moved down to 126, also in that time you had a strengthening of US data which, so not only did you have some level of risk aversion which would normally push money into US dollar, you also had this strength of US data that started to lead to the prospect of well, when is the US going to begin raising interest rates? Speculation that you know that may be sooner rather than later again helped to push money into the US dollar. Fed Reserve was pretty quick to come out and reinforce that they intend keeping rates low through to 2014, and that's a very important policy uh, uh, 
approach from the Fed Reserve because without sort of that low US dollar, they have little chance of kick-starting or continuing that sort of burst in manufacturing sector growth that they need to, um, to pull the economy uh, out of its sort of previous slump and obviously put Americans back to work. So <laughs> even though it might not be something that they come out and state and they're probably more inclined to suggest that they have a strong US dollar policy but uh, you know the reality is the policy decisions clearly support the opposite view. Um, so the prospect of quantitative easing three coming through over the next few months given that the ECB's finally put in place what appears to be an adequate solution to uh, the liquidity issues there, I think the prospect of this you know, suddenly becomes much greater and we're of the view that you know, probably as we move into March, April, we'd expect to see uh, something uh, around sort of this further stimulus measures out of the US. Okay, so that essentially sums up the macro view uh, across the next few months and into the latter part of uh, 2012 and moving out of sort of the uh, broader global view into the domestic economy and <coughs> rolling through the ASX top 50 stocks. Now AGK is, so for that again, given that we have a number of people joining us for the first time, I'll just take a moment to sort of summarise what Investor Signals is all about and the type of investment strategies that we implement. So essentially, you know, we're a top-down uh, an analysis approach and also you know, at an individual company level uh, from, from a bottom-up perspective. Now, our, given that we, throughout 2011 and you know, even into sort of the early parts of 2012, we've still had these sort of sovereign risk issues uh, occupy a big part of investor concern. Um, and for that reason, we've tended to skew both our internal account and client accounts towards stocks that we see over the course of sort of 2011 and now into 2012 that have reasonably defensive earnings uh, streams and in some cases we may be paying slightly elevated price to earning ratios to get access to that sort of defensive earnings streams but as a combination of the dividend income out of those investments combined with premium from sold calls, uh, we're able to sort of achieve a, a return that you know, outperforms the market. And you, if you look across the last 12 months, our return on investment has, has tracked uh, around the 10% mark and you know that significantly outperformed a market that from most price points is in actual fact been down 10%. Um, so AGK is one of those stocks that fits our investment criteria. We don't see a huge amount of earnings growth coming through, uh, probably somewhere around 5% earnings growth in 2012. The stock is not trading on an overly demanding uh, PE valuation and uh, <coughs> And in, in the instance of AGK, we hold the stock, we've sold the $15 calls uh, into the end of March. At this stage, it doesn't look like we'll be exercised on those, which is a suitable outcome for us. If the stock was to finish March somewhere between $14.50 to $15, that would then give us the opportunity to collect the upcoming dividend, collect the premium from the sold call, and then obviously reset the call into sort of that June period. Uh, so moving on from AGK, so Amcor is another corner state investment in uh, both our internal account and client accounts and Amcor is 85% uh, of its sales are in food, and tobacco and cigarettes. Um, <coughs> they're gradually increasing their presence in emerging markets so you know, we see that as a great growth opportunity for the business. On a price to earnings ratio, based on 2012 earnings, Amcor trades roughly at around not quite 13 times earnings, about 12.8 times earnings. We are pretty comfortable that into 2013 the company should deliver 10% earnings growth. So the company's already guided the market on the basis of 10 to 15%. We think with the minor slowdown that's taken place in Europe, uh, it's, it's going to be a stretch for them to hit the top end of that range. So based on company delivering 10% earnings growth into 2013, you're essentially buying the stock today on you know on roughly around 11 times earnings which we think is extremely good value for a fairly defensive revenue stream uh, the stock pays an 18 cent dividend on the 28th of february um, 
So we have been buyers of it just across the last few days and it's only now that we're starting to sell the calls into the 725 or 750 level. Uh, happy to deliver the stock if exercised but our, our expectation is that we collect the dividend, the stock sort of recovers from the dividend back up into this sort of 725 level and essentially across a six month, three to six month time frame we're looking to return from a combination of capital appreciation from the underlying share, the dividend and the call premium, uh, a return of somewhere between 5 to 10 percent return, 5 percent across three months, 10 percent across the six months, annualise that out at 20 percent and essentially that's our annual target rate of return from these type of defensive assets that I talk about. Um, so moving on into AMP, so <coughs> AMP from a PE standpoint uh, trades roughly around 13 times current earnings if you allow the sort of 5% earnings growth into 2013 pushes the PE uh, back down to around 12 times earnings. Now we don't see this as a particularly leveraged uh, play to a recovery in the global markets. Uh, our leverage play to a global recovery is still very much focused around the commodity stocks but in the case of AMP they pay a, a, a yield of around 5%. They got upcoming dividend on the uh, 27th of February. Uh, it's an undemanding PE. We think that fair value for the stock is probably more up around 475. Uh, as the stock pushes up around 450, comfortable to sell the calls into sort of that valuation target level that you see on screen there. Uh, ANZ, so for some time we've been ma maintaining that the banking stocks are certainly fair value in line with uh, where we see the broader market. But <laughs> the increase in funding costs, we're starting to see the first evidence of that in the banking results, first NAB and then CBA today. Um, in the investor signals reports across the last six months we've had a view that in 2012 the Australian banks were going to be lucky to deliver earnings growth much beyond 5% and with that in mind we've had a sort of broad target, the sort of 5 to 10% uh, share price appreciation from current levels really caps the upside story for banks. Um, so in the absence of the RBA coming through and cutting rates over the coming months, uh, the banks will have you know, to maintain margins, they're going to continue to creep their uh, interest rates up as we started to see already with uh, ANZ and Westpac. Uh, in the case of ANZ we see an upside target of around $23 uh, and anywhere sort of as the stock starts to approach $22, we're happy to sell the $23 calls into mid-year to uh, collect extra premium on top of the obvious dividend income that the, uh, that the banks already produce. ASX, so ASX we have this also as an uh, investment in our internal account and client accounts, so it pays a 93 cent dividend coming up at the end of this month. The stock trades roughly 14 and a half times current earnings. The earnings growth profile for the business, if you look at it from a year-on-year -year basis, you know, in 2012 we expect ASX to deliver again more at the lower end of that range, around 7% earnings growth. Uh, the stock's paying a 6.5% yield. Uh, in the instance that we've owned uh, ASX over the course of the last few months, we bought the stock, we've sold the $31 European call and if you're not familiar the difference between European and American options, essentially American means you can be called away at any time so uh, it's possible that you could get called away for, uh, for exercising of the, uh, of the dividend or essentially lose the right to uh, uh, receive the dividend over the stock, whereas a European option it can't be exercised to an expiry. So in the case of ASX, we see the stock moving sideways throughout 2012 and it's more of a fairly an aggressive or market neutral derivative strategy uh, where we're collecting the dividend and writing that European option to collect the premium. So when you combine the yield of the stock at 6% plus what we get out of the neutral uh, uh, derivative uh, position, we're achieving an annualised rate of return out of ASX uh, roughly around 15% and that's a name that we see fairly limited downside risk even if volatility was to pick up, ASX is a beneficiary of increased transaction volume. Uh, moving on from ASX, so we're not doing anything in AWC, so BHP's obviously come out with its earnings result. Um, 
the earnings result missed expectations slightly. Uh, from our take on the numbers, roughly, the bottom line was roughly down about 5% uh, on the same time last year. So previous corresponding period delivered earnings around 10.7. Current earnings came in at 9.9. Uh, the dividend was crept up marginally. Uh, the market was a little bit disappointed that there was not a capital initiative stated by BHP, so the prospect of a return of capital to shareholders. Uh, that somewhat disappointed the market and I think combine that with uh, just some of the shorter term concerns around China and the higher inflation print that came out a week or so ago and you've got the reason for this little sell-off. We've just stepped back into BHP today excuse me, as buyers of BHP on a sort of two to three month outlook. Uh, the key standout performance of the BHP result was a uptick in uh, the earnings from both iron ore and the energy sector. And if you look back over the last 12 months uh, in Investor Signals portfolio and our own account, uh, they've been our two overweight commodity uh, spaces, the iron ore and, and oil and gas. So moving on from uh, BHP, uh, Brambles, <laughs> so this is again one of those stocks that uh, we have had a significant exposure to throughout the last 12 months. Uh, in most cases we began loading up on Brambles uh, sort of through this low down here at around $6.50. We had a target into the end of March at $7.50, so even uh, when we were buyers of the stock back at these levels, uh, we didn't cap the upside growth of Brambles until it traded up to this 750 level. So it's trading on a high PE <coughs> at around roughly sort of 16 times earnings. We think from an earnings growth standpoint, the stock should deliver uh, low sort of double digit earnings growth between 10 to 15 percent. Um, some analysts are looking for number closer to around 20 percent. But again, given that we have a slightly more conservative macro outlook, our view is that the stock largely trades sideways from here. $7.50 caps the upside potential. Uh, we've got the stock paying a 26 um, uh, cent dividend uh, <coughs> on uh, the beginning of March there. Uh, CBA, uh, so CBA's first half 12 profit result came in at 3.58 billion. It was just slightly below market expectations. Their dividend was at 137. The market was looking for a number around 140. So there's slightly softer margins due to the creep in uh, cost of funding that we'd spoken about. And interesting that their wealth income was slightly lower as well, which impacted the result. Um, from a PE standpoint of view, the banks are cheap relative to their historical average, uh, but certainly the issue that face the banks is at the moment loan growth is slow, cost of funding is rising, and an outlook for the banks, again, difficult to forecast any type of earnings growth in excess of 5%. So on that basis, uh, given that we don't see any immediate re-rating to the PE uh, side of the market, uh, when you factor in earnings growth, I think it's hard to build a case that CBA trades much beyond sort of $52, $53 this year. Um, and just to sort of jump back to CBA, so our strategy on CBA, we've been owners of the stock. We've sold the $52 European call, so we collected the premium from that, uh, and plus we have no risk of losing the uh, stock or the upcoming dividend. So uh, <coughs> on that basis, we've essentially sort of have cover in the stock up to around sort of 53, well, 53.50, uh, and the stock goes ex -div on the 20th of February. Um, so at this stage, we'll collect the div, the $52 call should lapse, and that'll give us the opportunity to rewrite the call uh, and again achieve sort of that you know, annualised rate of return on CBA somewhere nearing around 15%. Uh, Coca-Cola, another one of the names that we have as a cornerstone investment in the portfolio. So Coca-Cola, we think, has a fairly bankable uh, earnings <coughs> uh, income stream or earnings growth rate. Uh, we see 2012 beating 2011 by roughly 5%. It's already trading on a fairly high PE, so this uh, leans back towards that point at the beginning where you are having to pay up 
the sort of the more defensive income streams. And in normal circumstances, if you're a plain vanilla equity investor, it's hard to build a case to own these sort of defensive income streams because there's really limited capital growth over 2012 when you're only talking 5% earnings growth and you're already paying a high PE. So our strategy here is at $12, we see the stock as fair value. Anywhere down around this 1150 level, we've been buyers. Anywhere back up at around $12, we start to sell again the European calls given that we're in dividend season. So we collect the upcoming dividend of 28 cents and the premium from the call. And then we look to reset that strategy following the expiry in March. Um, <clears throat> Not doing anything CFX. So computer shares are stock that uh, we've been patient with. Uh, the BMY Mellon uh, deal that was approved uh, late last year. So from the 1st of January onwards has been, well, but from, so from 1st January through to 30 June will be the first period of reporting where we start to see the benefits of the BMY uh, Mellon deal, which is a US uh, registry business that computer share uh, bought at the latter part of 2011. We think that that puts computer share in the area of delivering an earnings growth profile of somewhere around that 10 to 15 percent. Now the market's been disappointed with computer share's earnings throughout 2011 and understandably I think there's some reservation about paying up for growth but <laughs> we think when the result comes out it for the June half um, and it reflects the BMY Mellon transaction, we'll start to see a re-rating of computer share. We think throughout 2012 the stock starts to push back up towards that $9 level. So most recently we were buyers of it at around $7.70 and when the stock ran up to around $8.10 we sold the $8.25 calls into May. Uh, we collect the upcoming dividend of $0.14 cents and, the, uh, and, and if we had to deliver the stock at $8.25 it's obviously a good outcome when you combine the call premium, the capital return on the investment plus the dividend. Uh, if, if, however, the stock finishes May under 825, we'll look to roll that call up into that sort of June, July period up towards that 875 level and gradually with a year-end price target of around $9. CSL, this is an interesting name. The company's already confirmed that they're, that they're uh, expecting annualised earnings growth of around 10%. Now, CSL has a significant headwind of the high Aussie dollar. So in some ways, it's a, um, you know, it provides portfolios exposure to an asset that if the US dollar is to rally, uh, CSL at the margin is a beneficiary of that. But the main reason we like CSL at present is the underlying business is growing at 10% and the company's been conducting a $900 million share buyback. So on any significant dip in price, you know the company is in the market uh, as a significant buyer. Um, we've been buyers of the stock recently at around $30. We've sold the $33 calls into June, so that gives us roughly 10% capital growth plus the dividend will be the dividends not that significant in CSL uh, plus the call premium. Um, so fair value for CSL we see pushing back up to $33. Uh, Crown Casino, um, throughout 2011 our story on Crown is we really like the business trading on a high PE. We think it consolidates for longer but eventually it breaks up into the next price bracket of trading between sort of that 875 to $10 and I think as we move into the middle half of 2012 we start to see that unfold. Just overnight the Macau Crown uh, joint venture uh, <coughs> delivered a revenue growth of 30% uh, with EBIT growth up almost 70% so you know, any prospect there for you know, the early part of January, there's talks that maybe speculation on revenues sort of sliding in Macau, but you know, there doesn't seem to be any uh, end to the growth that is taking place in the gaming market in Macau. Uh, domestically, slightly different story, but nevertheless, we like Crown um, and gradually into the latter part of the year, I think you build a case that the stock moves higher, but we're not doing anything there at present. Fortescue's been one of our core iron ore exposures, so our investment uh, analysis on Fortescue is essentially if you go back to when iron ore was trading at around 160 US a ton, um, Fortescue was trading up at around $6.80, $6.50. Here was where the market got very bearish on the outlook of iron ore, started to value Fortescue on the assumption that forward rates for iron ore were going to remain at around 110. 
we never shared that view. We were always of the view that US earnings recover back to that, or the US market recovers back to that target of 12,500. And as a result, you start to see a recovery in commodity prices. So we remain long Fortescue. Um, 550 is what we've seen as the cap. So the earnings results out today supported roughly 20% year on year growth. The big story with Fortescue is their ramp up of production at the moment, doing 55 million tonnes a year. Um, pushing up to 150 million tonne a year. So that expansion uh, over the next two to three years with iron ore remaining at or near current levels supports a valuation on Fortescue upwards of, of $8. Now, you know, we're not buying into it on that short-term assumption. Right at the moment, we think the stock's sort of pushing up against sort of what we consider fair value between 550 to $6. Um, so the stock you know, we've already been beneficiaries of this recent rally. We now let the stock trade sideways and reassess new investment opportunities over the coming months. Not doing anything in GPT, uh, IAG not doing anything there. Uh, I think we might have I'll jump back to IAG, sorry. Okay, Luca, we're not doing there at present. So IPL is a stock that we like. This is a essential play on sort of fertilisers and global population growth and the demand for uh, you know grains and uh, <coughs> and high high quality sort of food products. Um, Insatec pivot. Um, currently trades on a low PE of roughly ten times earnings. Uh, one of the reasons why trades at a slight discount is the company has a fairly significant investment uh, underway with the development of a new plant in Queensland where the company's invested roughly a billion dollars in that. Now the commissioning of that plant uh, will not take place until June, July and I think the market is ascribing a sort of discount to IPL until uh, we see that plant commissioned and essentially the, the strategy executed by the board and management uh, as uh, detailed uh, in their forecast and business plan. Um, <coughs> DAP prices, which uh, essentially is the underlying instrument in fertilisers, uh, is holding up very well. So when we look out across the next 12 to 18 months, an IPL reports slightly out of sync with most of the top 50 companies, so we have to wait until May to see the next earnings result for IPL. But we think as we push into the middle of the year, IPL sort of can maintain a price range around that sort of 350 to 375 level. So it's certainly an asset that we like uh, long term. Uh, Leightons, we've been dubious of Leightons all throughout 2010 and 2011, mainly lack of transparency on the balance sheet and issues around Middle East uh, disclosures. Um, when I say Middle East disclosures, not the most recent ones that are occupied the news where it's been called into question uh, some of their, uh, their practices. Uh, <laughs> The issues around Middle East more so had to do with a valuation of the assets on the balance sheet from the GFC. Uh, I think we're kind of nearing the end of that. Uh, we're hesitantly looking at Leighton's as a stock that starts to creep back onto the radar as a buy on the dip story, but you need to be pretty certain that global growth is going to accelerate on a two to three year outlook to uh, build an investment case for Leightons. So we start to sort of view it as a buy on the dip story and hopefully we sort of hit that sort of cyclical low point in the business. Within the property space, Lend Lease is one of our preferred investments in saying that we don't have any exposure to the property, property sector with our, inside our internal account with the exception of uh, Westfield Property Trust, but certainly Leightons is on the radar. So when we look across the property space, it's pretty difficult right at this point in time to identify property stocks that are growing at or near 10% per annum. Therefore, you know, when you look at companies like Coca-Cola, Amcor, obviously different industry sectors, but we think it makes more sense to be in those names given that you know <coughs> the property stocks are not sort of at the sort of peak uh, economic environment to uh, see returns in you know, accelerating, but you know, maybe over the next year, year or so that starts to change. Uh, in the case of um, Leightons, they go uh, ex-div on the 2nd of March and reporting in the next couple of days, so we'll get a better handle on the uh, on the growth rate of Leightons following that result. But again, I think the company will be 
I think pushing it to achieve anything you know, close to that 10%, so probably more in that sort of 7 to 10% range. Not doing it there in Mervac, uh, Macquarie Group. So throughout 2011, we stayed clear of Macquarie. Our preference was to keep exposure to the Australian banks. We thought the whole investment banking space was just too risky. Uh, Macquarie obviously had excessive uh, overheads and excessive uh, staffing numbers, and you're starting to see a scale back of that at the moment. Um, the stocks had a good run on the back of uh, obviously the improvement in economic data in the US and the clear message to the market that the board is uh, putting in place programs to reduce uh, staffing numbers and uh, fixed uh, business operating costs. Um, just recently the result came out. The result it was at the lower end of market expectations. They essentially earnings contracted roughly 25% year on year. So if you go back 12 to 18 months ago, the company was running at around $900 million of earnings for the 12 months. We're now sort of running more down at around 650 to 700, and that's allowing for a pickup in the second half, given that you know we were more at a run rate of around 300 for the first half. Um, the company has announced a 10% buyback, and I think that sort of supports the price. Uh, but again, our, if we're looking for exposure to global recovery, recovery, we're still more inclined to stick with the iron ore and oil and gas. Uh, idea rather than the investment bank space. Uh, National Bank, as with the uh, all the banks, the story doesn't uh, differ too much. So NAB came out with their result. I suppose the big news with NAB is the prospect of them uh, selling off their UK assets. So the board has indicated that by May they will have concluded their uh, analysis on, on what they intend doing with their UK assets. At this point in time it's almost unanimous that the market believes that they will sell them off. It'll be at a slight discount to the value on the balance sheet, but that being a negative, the offset to that is that NAB trades at roughly a 20% discount to the other three major banks and that's because of their UK exposure. So if that was taken out of the picture there could potentially be a re-rating of NAB to uh, a, a price earning ratio that's similar to the other three banks that would give NAB, even at current earnings rate, a market valuation of close to around $25.50, $26. Um, the, in the NAB's most recent earnings result, weak earnings results out of the UK, higher um, bad debt levels, so none of that's a surprise. What did surprise the market is that the domestic banking division was flat. So I think there was that expectation that Australian banks would easily deliver 5% earnings growth and so the first result out of NAB uh, suggests that maybe the other three will struggle as well and then we saw that confirmed with CBA's result today. Newcrest has been one of our preferred uh, sort of investments over the course of the last month or so. We're sort of strong advocates that a rally was about to begin that would rally take the stock back up to this $35, $36 level. At this price point we're happy to sell calls into around this $37.50 level. We think in the, if the prospect of further QE uh, commentary starts to build in the market over the coming months, Newcrest will be a beneficiary from that. Company specific news from a production standpoint, the last 12 months gold production was roughly down 12% on the previous 12 months. Some of that was weather related issues. Obviously we don't see that or factoring that in again in the next 12 months. So we think that possibly they've hit sort of that inflection point on the poor production uh, cycle and over the course of 2012-2013 if production was just to pick up to its previous uh, its previous levels and gold was to remain around this 14 to $1,600 an ounce, uh, fair valuation for Newcrest is closer to $42 than where it is at you know, $34, $32 at present, so just keep that in mind. Um, the News Corp is obviously a big beneficiary of the very aggressive buyback. There's been $5 billion that uh, Murdoch has, or News Corp has been buying back of company shares. They're only halfway through that at the moment and they've reconfirmed that they intend to conclude that buyback by June. So there's another $2.5 billion almost, not quite 25 
that needs to be brought back across the next sort of three and a half months. So that's a short time frame considering it's taken them uh, almost eight months already to buy two and a half billion dollars. So uh, both earnings result beat expectations. Uh, U.S. economic recovery seems to be gaining traction um, and aggressive buyback by the company in saying that we see the stock is pretty fully valued where it is. So take away that added demand from the buyback. I'm not sure that uh, there's a case that it trades too much higher. I think Origins at the low end of its valuation range. We see it as a buying opportunity. We think over the next three to six months Origin trends back up towards $15. Uh, interesting to watch the upcoming earnings results. So the 23rd of Feb is their half year 2011 result. Um, so we'll watch that one with interest. Uh, not doing there in Orica. So oil search so across the oil and gas play. Oil search Santos Woodside Petroleum. We've been aggressive investors in those names over the last 12 months. Uh, oil search is $6.50. We think it's fair value. The real story with oil search is if, if oil prices hold up around these levels, the extra production that comes online over the next 18 months um, supports a valuation on oil search closer to sort of $8. Um, in saying that, right at this point in time, our preference has been to play uh, Santos and Woodside Petroleum. Um, I'll come to, uh, well actually while I'm on it, let's look at the specific earnings dates around the oil and gas stock. So interesting note, so for the year ending 31st of December, Brent crude averaged roughly $111 a barrel which was up 38% on the previous year and this is the highest yearly nominal average in the history of, uh, of crude. So you know, even though we've had significant price spikes in the past around you know, event driven price spikes, uh, the fact that oil is maintained around this 111 on a 12 month average, that's the highest average uh, price in history. So. A little bit of trivia there for you, uh, but I'm sure uh, fueling up the car each week we all get reminded of that. So Santos starts Australian energy sector reporting on the 17th of February, oil search reports on the 21st and then Woodside on the 22nd. So spread out over the week starting the 17th, we've sort of got the grouping of all the major oil and gas stocks within that top 50 reporting, so that's one to keep an eye on. Uh, Qantas not doing anything there at the moment, sort of if anything we've sort of been advocates of shorting Qantas. QBE, the management's disappointed with earnings results, they never seem to meet the guidance that they put out. <clears throat> uh, the real headwinds for QBE, as I'm sure you know, all investors understand, is the high Aussie dollar and the lowest, low US uh, interest rates. We don't see a change in either of those factors in the short term, so um, although we don't see any further downside risk to QBE, uh, putting aside that you know management has not done a great job with meeting the guidance and forecast that they've provided the market and <coughs> not getting too aggressive on anything there. So QRM, um, obviously great business at, the pre at present, going through some great sort of cost reduction, winning more contracts, expanding, is trading on a very high PE and we've been of the view that around $3.70 uh, starts to cap the upside potential for QR National. So we're expecting some level of retracement or sideways price action in 2012 from current price levels. Um, Rio, so again if we go back to this iron ore story, at 110 an ounce, uh, at 110 US dollars a ton I should say, uh, <coughs> that's essentially where the market was forecasting iron ore prices to remain when they were valuing Rio down at around $60. Iron ore is now back up to 140 uh, on that basis and if we have a view that um, inflation has been slightly above trend in China, uh, there are some issues around the uh, housing market or construction market in general in China. Um, in the absence of sort of further quantitative easing coming through out of the Federal Reserve, and the ongoing uh, malaise in Europe, I think the base case for iron ore is that we're back to fair value and it tracks sideways at around 140 a tonne. Um, on that assumption, again putting in place the discounted PE that we think maintains 
uh, across all market assets. Um, fair value for Rio over the course of the next, uh, say, let's say through to June, should be between seventy to eighty dollars. So that's the bandwidth that we see the stock trading at. Um, unlike BHP that saw a contraction in its earnings on a twelve-month um, uh, basis, or you know, looking back twelve months from the prior year. Uh, Rio delivered roughly 8% earnings growth, um, whereas BHP obviously uh, had roughly 5% contraction. Uh, the prospect of uh, Rio uh, being more aggressive around its capital initiatives, I think it also builds a case for sort of Rio being a cornerstone investment in that sort of uh, bulk commodity allocation in client accounts. So. Um, We've been holders of Rio from prior levels. We were patient uh, and we held sort of through uh, the sell-off in September. We were fortunate to sell long-dated uh, call options in Rio, which uh, added to what is otherwise a low-yielding stock with the premium that we collected from the call. Holding Rio even across the last six months, we well and truly outperformed cash. We're now back in an environment where Rio's back to our sort of fair value range and we're selling calls a little bit further out and allowing capital growth. So within sort of the oil and gas and iron ore sector on a 12-month outlook, we're still allowing for capital growth, unlike sort of some of those more defensive names like Coca-Cola where we see them sort of largely tracking sideways. Uh, not doing anything there in Stocklands. Their result came out a little bit below market expectations, earnings down. Uh, roughly 8% so residential and uh, in particular retirement uh, living uh, earnings which we expected to see as a growth segment within the business uh, also contributed to that lower number. Um, but right at this point in time we don't see any significant r risks with Stockland and we see the stock tracking sort of more up back towards that 350 level but that sort of caps full side up value for Stocklands. Not doing anything in Sonic. So Santos, we've been aggressive at buyers of Santos over the last three to four months. Santos has made up a uh, significant allocation with our own internal account and <coughs> we've capped the upside in Santos at $14. So uh, based on a PE valuation, we're looking for the stock to sort of push up against the top end of its sort of price range and largely move sideways from where we're at. Where where we're at at present with the earnings result coming out in a couple of days. So we'll sort of take a look at that and comment further next week. Suncorp not doing there at present. So Transurban, so a bit of a rotation today out of risk into sort of the, some of these higher yielding names. So we saw Woolworths, Transurban, uh, Coca-Cola, Amcor, uh, all uh, beneficiaries of money flow, flowing into those names today. Um, on a earnings outlook basis, I don't, it's hard to build a case that Transurban trades much above $6. I think at a 6% yield with uh, moderate earnings growth of around 5%, um, I don't think the stock has the earnings growth profile to justify a price much above $6 because that's going to push the yield down to 5% or sub 5% and there's too many other high quality assets on the market that are offering uh, higher yields than what Transurban would do if it was to push uh, too high in price from here. Uh, Telstra, so we've been long term buyers of Telstra, we've been buyers on a buyer on the dip story with Telstra for the past 18 months or so. We had a year-end price target in 2011 of $3.25. It essentially almost hit that to the cent. Um, our next earnings target on Telstra is three fifty, and that's in the absence of the NBN uh, capital sort of management initiatives. So we're obviously in the camp that you know that all uh, takes place, but you know in due course. So if you just take the current earnings growth rate of Telstra, which is very low single digits. So if you look at the first half 12 earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortisation, it came in at roughly 3.7% earnings growth uh, to deliver a final number of around 4.75 billion. So <coughs> bottom line up three, three almost 4%. Revenue was up 1.2. So you can see that some of that uh, bottom line benefits coming from cost control. Um, the earnings growth profile over the next few years is pretty flat and on that assumption if you just simply take the same PE that other telco stocks trade at, fair value for Telstra is roughly around 350. If you add in a really positive 
outcome with return of capital to shareholders following the MBN finalisation. You could build a case that tells the trades closer to sort of 375, but I think that really caps uh, any upside uh, valuation in Telstra. So uh, right at the moment our view is between 325 and 350 is fair value for Telstra. Uh, toll holding. So this is a stock that uh, we're watching with interest. Uh, <coughs> there's a number of uh, hedge funds that have uh, built up short exposure in toll over the last week or two. We wouldn't be surprised if we start to see some of those put under pressure over the next week or two and there could be some level of short squeeze in toll which will then set up a, uh, a, short, a second sort of shorting opportunity that, that I'd be more inclined to take note of. So you know, if you're sort of more of a shorter term trader and you look for both short and long positions in the market, just keep that one on your watch list. If it was to break up the sort of 580, uh, you know, on some positive momentum in the market and a bit of short covering, it may throw up a, a good uh, opportunity. Uh, Westpac Bank, the story there is the same with all the banks, lucky to push 5% earnings growth. We think sort of full price for Westpac's around $21, $22. So Westfield today came out with a result. The result was nothing stunning. I think it was more the capital initiatives and the share buyback. So I think there was a few hedge funds that were still short uh, Westfield. So there's a bit of a squeeze on there today. Um, we think the price settles back down. 350 is full value for Westfield, uh, but again based on earnings growth outlook and yield um, competitiveness relative to other assets in the market, uh, around 850 caps, sort of the upside value there for Westfield. West Farmers we see as good value as we do with uh, uh, Woolworths. So buying West Farmers at uh, 13 half, 14 times earnings, uh, we think a good defensive entry point in a West Farmers. It does require the call strategy to complement the dividend income to sort of get up to achieving that sort of 10% uh, earnings growth across a six month period. But <coughs> our base case on West Farmers is that gradually trades back up towards sort of that $31.50 to $33 over the coming months. I'm not doing in Wally Parsons there. Uh, so Woolworths, <laughs> so when you look at Wes Farms, I'll just quickly reference the difference between the two businesses. So uh, in the case of Wes Farmers, their resource earnings growth is around 20%, but their <laughs> core assets in Bunnings and Woolworths, uh, Bunnings and Coles, I should say, are growing at roughly 5%. And uh, with the exception of Coles, Bunnings has contracted from around 10% earnings growth down to 5%. And uh, <laughs> on that basis, um, when you make the comparison to Woolworths where if you go back six months ago their food and liquor was only growing at around 2% and that's down from historically uh, growth rates up at around 10 to 12% going back a number of years. So <coughs> the company's looking for earnings growth between 2 to 6%. The most recent quarter being the December quarter, uh, food and liquor was growing at about 5.1%. So the board's strategy at present to drive down operating costs uh, and rationalise some of the assets and we start and they're looking at obviously the sale of Dick Smith as the first part of that. Um, I think on a two to sort of five year outlook, I think we'll look back and still recognise that Woolworths, as is West Farmers, is just substan a great value uh, at the range that they're currently trading. Um, from a shorter term point of view, uh, given that the earnings growth rate is a little muted. We don't see upside in uh, Woolworths much beyond sort of $26. So our strategy has been to buy the stock uh, initially back at these levels and again in the most recent days and it's only today that we've started to set those call levels up to $26 where we collect the 59 cent dividend coming out at the end of March and the premium from the sold calls. And Woolworths fits into that category where we have an annualised uh, target return of close to 20% when we combine the capital return, the dividend and the call premium. Uh, moving on to Woodside, so Woodside was uh, one of our 2012 growth recovery stories and if you're an Investor Signals client, our base case was sort of remain patient and as we move into March, you'd start to see a recovery in Woodside and that ties in with the Pluto project coming online after significant delays throughout last year. Uh, Woodside report their earnings result um, on the 22nd of uh, February uh, and GoXDiv uh, 
a short while later around the 24th. Uh, we think sort of the fair valuation for Woodside is pushing more back up towards that sort of $40 level and we think that'll probably be recognised throughout 2012. So again, it comes back to that thematic where we're overweight, iron ore and these uh, energy names. I'm not doing anything there in Westfield uh, Trust and then back to AGK. All right. Um, now, to conclude tonight's presentation, I think we'll finish off on the short-term outlook on the XJO uh, and then take a look at the Market Analyzer 7, the upcoming release. So up on screen, the graph of the XJO. Now, <coughs> our base case is that US market remains fairly buoyant through earnings season, but we do get a little bit of a sell-off once we get onto the other side of earnings season. We don't see that as anything material, so our broad expectation is the market pushes marginally higher. We then get a retracement, a bit of a consolidation phase, but ultimately as we get into sort of March, April, May, the rhetoric that will pick up around quantitative easing and the ongoing downward pressure on the sovereign yields in Europe and combined with that I think some level of policy response, possibly even a unified front from Europe, China and America should continue to put an adequate base under equity valuations uh, and build uh, the support level for maybe a further push higher uh, from, from current levels. Uh, <coughs> So that uh, wraps up our whole market review. Um, I'd just like to move the presentation back in the screen and just have a chat with you about the upcoming release or the current release of the Market Analyzer 7. So I've put up on screen here five reasons why I think the new MA7 is better than the MA6. And for someone that you know, has used the MA6 for, you know, essentially, you know, from from market open to market close for the last almost 10 years, it's a big change to uh, shift that sort of <coughs> mentality from the old product to the new product. Um, <coughs> my own experience was that, excuse me, just a quick sip of water. My own experience was that initially I had some uh, reservations and some hesitation as to the shift to the new product, and it probably took me five days or six, you know, or roughly a week of <coughs> transitioning back and forward between the two products before I ultimately sort of felt comfortable that <coughs> the new environment, one, I could navigate my way around it, and two, that you know, I was convinced of the benefits of the new product. So I suppose I share that with you um, in that if your first <coughs> uh, experience is you know, probably not going to be that dissimilar to mine and it's a matter of just persevering and I think you find across sort of a five to seven day period uh, I'm sure you'd sort of reach the same conclusion as me. So <coughs> the main reasons why I think the new MA7 is better is <coughs> the main reason is the improved data delivery. So there's no more data timeout errors. Uh, that would sometimes occur or you know, often occur in MA6. There's no more uh, corrupt uh, data. Um, the one to sort of point to, the platform stability. I can leave MA7 running permanently on my computer. I don't have it uh, crashing. I have no issues with you know, it hanging and you know, not closing down and having to do Control-Alt-Delete. Um, you know, so the general product stability is a quantum leap forward and, and I think that's the most important thing to take on board with where MDS is heading with the development of the new MA7. Um, for a feature that I find you know, <coughs> an essential part of a trading platform is a really solid reliable alert function. I found sometimes the MA6 alert functions uh, wouldn't be triggered for you know whatever reason. I find MA7 the alert service is arguably the best and most robust in the Australian market, and I think you know when you use it, you'll 
experience the same uh, you know, outcome and conclusion that I reached. So the improved order integration as we move <coughs> more down a development path of integrating transaction functionalities from uh, different areas of the product from you know, hopefully you know, in the near future from the charting component where conditions are met that it feeds into a, a, an order but even right at the moment the ability to click and trade from a whole variety of <coughs> areas of the product uh, I think is a big benefit and that the MA7 includes a, a great a comprehensive sort of conditional order pad uh, <coughs> and also then finally the comprehensive data coverage for the ASX. So I find that there's sort of improved security information so uh, whereas the old MA6 just had sort of limited uh, data uh, when it came to you know, fundamental information and clicking on security information and <coughs> there's a lot more customizable watch list and market depth uh, data feeds. So they're just some of the experiences that I've had with the product that I wanted to share with you. And then this next slide is just to reinforce that um, with the development of the MA7, MDS is, um, I'm pleased to say, very focused <coughs> on uh, re-initiating uh, some of the uh, innovation that led uh, MDS to you know, enjoy uh, and the clients to enjoy the benefits of the market analyzer technology. Um, so uh, certainly those, that innovation cycle has been hampered over the last year or so as strategically the company <coughs> had to uh, you know, decide on an ultimate solution uh, of either reinvesting in the old MA6 technology or moving to the complete new sort of framework and platform that we have now in the MA7. And now that the development resources of the business will not be consumed with um, data delivery related issues, uh, we can sort of go back to um, <coughs> this innovation cycle of delivering tools that not only are ideas that are presented by our customer base but also ideas that are presented by um, uh, the development team including myself uh, around you know people that are trading the market every day and understanding really what it is the clients looking for so some of the ideas that uh, when we look at the product that I just wanted to chat with you about so throughout 2012 I would like to see that we're able to bring to you price alerts to be set from the charts as well as the text-based settings in the work alert window and again I'll demonstrate that when we look at the software in a moment. Uh, save chart space on the right side of the graph. I find it very frustrating that uh, the graph is always pushed up against the right side and I'll again demonstrate that when we get to it. So auto text-based comments in charts. So we hope to deliver you uploaded text comments to your charts that have buy, sell, rex, div dates, consensus earnings and so forth on the charts. So the product moves into an environment of not just being a technical platform but also delivering fundamental data integrated into your charts. Indicator alerts, so for people that are technical traders and have a variety of templates rather than just setting alerts off price levels, having alerts running off your technical uh, indicator settings which will later feed into populating uh, order pads is ultimately where we see that uh, sort of innovation heading and uh, I suppose that moulds into that fifth point there with auto trading tools. So with covering off on those points let's uh, go into the product and just have a quick look at it. Um, so <coughs> the base product, and I'll just shut down some of these charts. So the base product there is on screen and broadly the features that we're used to out of MA6 are essentially all the same. So as you saw tonight the charting component hasn't really changed too much at all. Uh, the scanning tool is still there as we would know it. Uh, drop down list, select your watch list, select your market, calculate and you know, it gives you a list of uh, scanning results the same as the MA6 would do. Now the watch list layout I enjoy more than the MA6. I think sort of having uh, this screen layout like what I work with here I find it easy to sort of keep on top of the ASX top 20, the top 50 here, easy to sort of toggle between the different watch lists. Now this is the alert engine that I was talking about so just to um, touch on sort of that idea that I presented with the uh, charts. I'll just bring a chart into screen. Uh, let's say we type in BHP here. So 
one of the uh, fun innovations that I'd like to see in the platform is over here on the price axis, on the Y axis here, is simply where if this here was able to be clicked and dragged, and you can drop that wherever you want, right click, turn it on or off, and essentially you could have sort of an entry alert, a stop loss alert, and an exit alert um, <coughs> running, and that when you set those slides from the graph, it would populate your order pad, and given that the uh, alert engine is so robust, it could manage a, you know, a certainly a large quantity of alert functions that you know, could be popped up and let you know when your price triggers have been met, and again, you know, later the innovation taking that into populating an order pad and being able to uh, send the orders you know, straight into the market. Um, so tonight's presentation is not so much about running through every uh, little window within the market analyzer. It's about sort of just letting you know that the new MA7 uh, is here. Um, part of tonight's uh, presentation, and I'll just bring this uh, back into screen. Is to encourage those that have attended tonight's presentation to. Uh, an early adopter of the Market Analyzer 7, so we're offering an opportunity sort of following tonight's webinar that MDS will be emailing all attendees and inviting you to become an early adopter of the new MA7 technology. Uh, we'd greatly appreciate the fact that uh, you become part of the first group to shift across to the new improved platform and to say thank you, you know, we'd like to st extend our appreciation by continuing to invite you to these uh, to join us in these sort of weekly market strategy sessions across the coming months um, as a way of um, you know acknowledging that uh, you've put the time and effort in to come across uh, early ahead of sort of the bulk of the customers and I suppose I just reinforce one of the added advantages of doing it sooner rather than later is that you will have uh, access to technical support and weekly um, webinars uh, on how to use the Market Analyzer 7 in an environment that's probably not quite as uh, uh, rushed or demanding as if you were to wait till the uh, release into mid-March. So obviously technical support's not going to be inundated with phone calls and have more time to spend with you to uh, run you through the product and explain how it works. Uh, and then obviously keep in mind that you get the added benefit of access to these market strategy sessions, and, you know, hoping that you found value in them this evening. So on that note, uh, I thank everyone for listening in and I encourage you to respond to MDS's email and take advantage of the sort of early adoption of the Market Analyzer 7 technology and I look forward to speaking again next week.